announce the uh, pro, uh, uh, Rachel Rosenfeld, our moderator of uh, this this keynote that we've been looking forward to uh, since we started planning this year. Uh, Rachel is the associate director of the Creative Publishing and Critical Journalism Master's Program at the New School for Social Research. That's a new program that uh, Rachel has been a part of making. But how we know Rachel, uh, how the committee knows Rachel, uh, she is the co-founder and co-publisher of The New Inquiry. And a lot of people who have, been, have spoken at this event and the committee uh, have been really involved with The New Inquiry. It's been an important publication, and it's a real honor to have Rachel uh, uh, moderating this last keynote panel. So I'm going to hand it off to Rachel to uh, 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 present this panel. But thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. <laughs> When Nathan um, texted me asking me to moderate this, he said, um, I'm, I'm literally quoting your text, you would, the moderator, kind of play part of the audience member who doesn't know anything about Russian politics. Um, so I'm, I'll try really hard to convey that, that persona. Um, but um, we have two real experts here on the panel. Um, so first I'll introduce um, Vesely Gatov. Um, Vasily is a Russian media researcher and author with over 30 years of practice in newspaper, agency, and broadcast journalism, as well as media management and futurism. He is a visiting fellow at the USC Annenberg Center on Communication, Leadership, and Policy. And Adrian Chen is a reporter for The New Yorker. He is a uh, board member of The New Inquiry, and he is also the co-director of a short documentary called The Moderators, um, which is coming out on Friday from Field of Vision. So uh, check Adrian's Twitter for that in a week, a little under a week. Friday. All right. Uh, so, um, <laughs> um, so I guess uh, just to start things off, you two have a really great rapport. You know each other really well. And I think it would be interesting for everyone to find out how you met and just that the genesis story of your relationship. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, no, we, we've known each other for a while now. I think I first contacted Vasily in um, 2014 or maybe, yeah, probably 2014. I was working on a story about online Russian uh, trolling and propaganda, um, which was something that the entire world was not yet talking about. Um, and there really wasn't a lot out there that was kind of reliable. You know, there was, um, I wasn't even really sure of how big of a phenomenon it was in Russia. It sounded kind of outlandish that, you know, this was actually a thing that people would hire, you know, Russians to leave kind of fake comments on live journal accounts and social media and things. Um, but my friend who is a reporter at BuzzFeed recommended that I talk to Vasily because Vasily had done a lot of research on kind of Russian trolls back in kind of 2013, 2012, when they were first coming up in the Russian internet. And so we had a, a pretty good conversation about that and I think um, really filled me in on kind of the extent to which this kind of um, internet propaganda is, is a real, you know, le legitimate tactic that, that they use uh, uh, in Russia. And then we've continued to talk and um, I think as what what I've I've really appreciated is that you, um, unlike a lot of I think people who are kind of commenting on on Russian propaganda and, and Russian internet trolls, you worked in the Russian media, you were Russian um, and have a lot of firsthand experience and I find I've found it extremely useful to, to talk to you about that. I just uh, want to add that when Adrian called me, we spoke for about four hours, and I was walking in the courtyard. It was so interesting, so engaging, uh, uh, and and I'm really happy to know him because he's a absolutely brilliant writer and researcher. Um, I just want to kind of summarize my experience here. That we first, I was working for. Uh, large Russian uh, news agency at the moment as director for innovation and we discovered an interesting phenomenon of uh, mass following of Twitter accounts, live journal accounts and so on where where the population of audience had been jumping for thousands a day uh, without any reasonable 
any reason for that because there was no content that could have been viral or there was no endorsements uh, from popular accounts and so on. And then we started to, mm, to analyze these uh, newcomers and then we realized that these newcomers are actually artificial entities and that, th that these, those artificial en entities are controlled because they do certain actions at a certain time and then they started to command actually because they created a script uh, attached to uh, kind of a traditional uh, botnet uh, software that uh, is used, for example, to to fish uh, credit card numbers, uh, or the one which is used to uh, discover the reali reliability of websites, which kind of demonstrate kind of DDoS attacks uh, of different scale, and then. Finally, we realized that it is being used in a pol as a political tool because, uh, for example, it was used to inflate the audience, to demonstrate that the audience of uh, uh, Russian president account is bigger than any other audience in, in the country. And uh, Dmitry Medvedev, who was president at this time, was really disappointed discovering that his Twitter account is mostly followed by bots. <laughs> so uh, when we made this um, research public and mm, sort of in spring of 2012, it was already going for about two years. Uh, I think it was the first time when this subject actually <coughs> emerged, that there, there is a political use of botnets and uh, kind of trolling. Well, well the trolling was very in the very early stage, but I mean, we already discovered this. Um, so, I mean, I want to I wanna, um, keep with you, Vasily, because um, you are, you've been around the block a couple of times in this. Um, so you have a 30 year history as your bio says, just looking at the media, you've worked in different organizations, you know the people that are involved in what, when we talk about this, you know, Russian intelligence or Russian media, you know exactly who we're talking about. Um, but also in that 30 year period, um, the internet happened. Um, so I would love to hear kind of chronologically from your perspective, how um, Russia and and the internet have uh, you know uh, evolved and developed over the last thirty years to the point at which you discovered this bot <laughs> thing. Um, well, technically, the emergence of internet in Russia is uh, uh, a perfect confirmation of American meddling into Russian internal affairs, <laughs> because public internet uh, has been brought to Russia by George Soros. Uh, this, uh, this was his joint venture with uh, some Russian physicists uh, from Kurchatov Institute uh, called Savam Tsiliport that uh, became the primary provider of internet services in Russia sometime 1986, just after Chernobyl. Uh, and I think the first time I've uh, used email was about this same time, I mean like prob probably like late uh, 1986. I became a permanent internet user from 1991. It was a dial-up, also hooked to the same network. Uh, probably Soros was reading all our emails. <laughs> 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 Subverting Russians into liberal democracy. <laughs> um, but um, uh, generally, uh, as, as mostly everywhere uh, except the United States, internet has been developing as an uh, activist platform as uh, as uh, partisan media, partisan not in terms of that it's politically partisan, but I mean when you wanted to start your own site, you don't have to ask anyone, you don't have to register and, and, uh, and so on, and, 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 and because Soviet Union ceased to exist in 1991, nobody cared uh, at all. So for probably first uh, 10 years uh, of from 1990 to, to 2000, internet was uh, a very brave, funny, uh, developing place, uh, which uh, created some of uh, great Russian companies, actually, like uh, uh, Yandex, uh, the, the, the only remaining competitor uh, to Google in, uh, in Europe, uh, like Mail.ru, a huge Russian uh, I guess it was started like a mail s uh, email service, but then it just merged into a huge media organization uh, and services provider. Uh, uh, most of the people who created that were my f sort of my friends. Some of them were schoolmates and so on. So I've been 
I've been developing my knowledge together with them. Uh, and then somehow in early days of uh, the first decade of, the century, uh, of this century, Russian uh, power government had discovered the power of internet. And it's a very particular moment when it happened. It was 2002, there was a th terrorist attack uh, in Moscow when uh, Chechen fighters had uh, captured about 1,000 uh, mm, hostages at the theater at Dubrovka. And because the government's, well, I would say, uh, with consent from journalists, suspended the coverage to a very, very limited scale, I mean, just only reporting the formalities of anti-terrorist -ter operation, uh, Live Journal had became uh, a, a major platform for distributing news, and they just discovered it. And since then, Russian government started to find means to control or at least to be aware of what's happening there. Uh, and because Russia has pretty good linguistic, computational linguistic school and cryptology school. I mean, they quite uh, fast had found the tools and means how to operate it and how to play their own role. Uh, and uh, at a certain moment, it evolved in things like uh, like a the agency, whom, whom uh, Adrian described. Uh, it developed into a range of Russian hackers of all types. Uh, who are famous in cracking into uh, emails, banks, uh, and, and uh, security systems. Uh, and it created a huge chunk of people who fight them, uh, like Kaspersky antivirus and Kaspersky security. You can think about them, whatever. I mean, he, he definitely was educated at the KGB school, but they do a great work of uh, sort of protecting people's computers from invasion and so on. So that's, that's, that's the way how the story developed. Mm -hmm. And now, we, mean we see that at, at <laughs> we discussed that at the moment when one of the major narratives is about that Russian hack DNC and then Russians kind of med uh, were meddling into American uh, political discourse with some evilish tools that, uh, mm, well, then they just you try to be critical on that and they you don't find any of these tools. Mm. And uh, or, or at least you don't find them so far. Mm. Um, so Adrian, I want you to, you, you mentioned Vasily the, the agency article, um, which is I think the first that a lot of us found out about this troll, Russian troll farm. Um, so I guess, do you wanna just pick up the narrative from the point of the bots to the present date um, and in your own research? Yeah, uh, so I guess I, I first became aware of you know the the kind of online propaganda in Russia and and the kind of um, you know state efforts to control and shape the narrative through this organization called the Internet Research Agency, which um, I read an article in BuzzFeed I think in 2013 or 2014 where a bunch of emails had been leaked from this organization called the Internet Research Agency that was supposedly kind of, they, they called it a troll farm, and it was like this kind of notorious organization in Russian media that was being hired, uh, was hiring hundreds of young Russians to leave comments pro-Putin, uh, you know, anti-opposition, uh, like pushing the Kremlin narrative on Live Journal, Facebook, Twitter, um, and somebody, you know, some opponents of the Kremlin had hacked their emails and, and leaked a bunch of stuff and, and suddenly this whole organization was kind of out in the open. And it turned out that they were doing some kind of trolling in the US and so they had been, you know, creating these fake accounts that uh, pretended to be Americans, pretended to be, you know, critics of the US government. And this was just kind of, you know, a small, I think, tech story in BuzzFeed, but I was really, interested in that and uh, kind of shocked that that was happening. Um, and so in 2014, I spent about like six, six or seven months just investigating the agency. There were all these emails that had come out, so I was able to kind of get a pretty good picture of, of what was going on and, and talk to people. Um, I ultimately, I have a presentation here. Uh, I ultimately wrote this article for the New York Times Magazine 
uh, that was about the Internet Research Agency. And, um, you know, this is this is just some stats about it. It was founded in 2013. It had a budget when I was there of $4.8 million a year and 400 employees. Uh, it was supposedly run by this guy who is... Um, He's his nickname is like the the Kremlin's chef or Putin's chef or something. He's a he's a kind of restaurateur oligarch who um, is kind of a big supporter of the Kremlin and and was supposedly funding this whole thing um, kind of to to help Putin and and this is actually inside the agency here. Here is just a bunch of people leaving trolls uh, leaving comments on on social media. Um, and I just wanted to do a short presentation because there's a lot of been a lot of talk about you know Russian trolls. This was a big theme of the um, intelligence, uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee hearing that there were thousands of Russian trolls that were seeding you know propaganda on the internet. Um, and I wanted to just kind of go through some of the troll trolling that I, I found when I was investigating. And this, this was, was from basically um, in the emails. emails they, they leaked, leaked up maybe like three or four um, accounts that had been run by the Internet Research Agency. And from that, I was able to kind of just piece together, you know, see who they were following, who the, you know, who were following them, what they were tweeting, you know, because the way it works is, is every, all these accounts will tweet the same things, you know, at the same time. And so if you know what kind of hashtag they're promoting, what kind of language they're using, you can kind of see, oh, yeah, these are all the same, you know, run by the same operation. Um, and so, you know, here's here's like one, just an example of some of the Facebook comments that um, these trolls were leaving. Uh, this guy, Kyle Branson, American president is a face of the great country. It represents the interest, culture, and American nation. Too bad Obama is not the right one. I just <laughs> <Too> cannot, <bad. laughs> I just cannot wait for the next elections. Um, and, you know, it was, Okay, what this is Thomas Gowers. He was a really popular guy. He 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 was very active. What what the hell is wrong with our legislation? It seems like all the new reforms are focused only on making a profit for the ruling political clans, but not on the improvement of the society's life. Um so it's pretty easy. It was pretty easy to figure out, you know, these guys and they're just like commenting on every, you know, news story. Um, leaving these kinds of comments, you know, one thing that I learned quickly is that in Russia, they um, instead of smiley face, they only do uh, parentheses. So it's like instead of like a colon or parentheses, they'll just do parentheses. And the the really sloppy ones would would use that, you know, as as a smiley face, and you're just and very obvious. Um, and there were like some more elaborate ones. Uh, this is I am ass. They created this kind of cartoon character. Um, who would leave these comments like D Demo hashtag Democrats vainly trying to preserve their hashtag president from impeachment and jail hashtag impeach Obama and they even made these like little memes saving Barack Obama with the little ass character here um, they were it was like a kind of creative agency as well as you know a promotion agency they had illustrators they had um, people who were uh, very skilled at like Photoshop, and and that's what they use to kind of create some of these um, these like fake disasters on social media that they were trying to. It seemed convince people that that these disasters were were happening just through you know Twitter and and social media. And so the one that I found in my research was uh, September eleventh, twenty fourteen, where a bunch of people started tweeting about this explosion in um, Centerville, Louisiana. And this is a tweet from, you know, thousands that were sent that day, kind of claiming that there was this huge explosion. Um, they they made these fake CNN pages, you know, that that seemed to report on it. Um, and they even made some videos. I don't know if this will play. So this was like a video that they were spreading that that was supposedly somebody watching TV as ISIS took responsibility. Um, and I don't know if you, you can't hear it, but there's even some like voice, some really bad acting being like, what the hell is going on here? Uh, <laughs> and this was just like, yeah, they were spreading this, you know, as if this was kind of, um, proof that, 
that ISIS had claimed responsibility for it. Um, and yeah, I mean, those that was kind of the most impressive things that they did. They, you know, there was another th- hoax where they said there's o- Ebola outbreak in uh, Atlanta. You can see that they kind of would jump on these other popular hashtags to try to try to m- make it go viral. <laughs> Um, some bad news. One more Ebola infected arrived in Atlanta these days. <laughs> what a shame. Um, and this one also, so, so here's just a whole bunch of, you know, different tweets about, uh, about the supposed outbreak. They, they came up with this name, fake name of Yata Kire, who was supposedly this, this nurse from Nigeria, I think. It was a very elaborate backstory. And they also made a video here, um, which was, you know, supposedly... Uh, the victim coming in to the airport. (laughs) And this was like, you know, just uh, posted as if like, yeah, look, somebody caught the victim coming in. Um, And you can't hear the sound, but they were playing Beyonce in the background to like, like I think 7-Eleven had just come out, so they were like playing that. And there's even um, a little logo from the Atlanta airport here. So it was a very elaborate um, operation that was going on there. And I think that's... Seems like the best job in media you can <laughs> have. Yeah, Working so, for the agency. so yeah. Those, those were the kinds of things that I had found um, during my investigation. I wrote a very, very long story about it uh, in the New York Times Magazine that came out in, in, um, in 2015. And that was kind of you know, maybe six months before the campaign really took off and, you know, a year before uh, trolling and Russian propaganda became such a huge thing. And so it's been kind of surreal uh, to to watch it go from this kind of weird phenomenon that that, uh, I was just obsessed with to now being like the number one, you know, political (laughs) issue. Um, Sorry, just helping you out there with that. Okay, so you went on like a, a, I don't know if it's a rant or whatever. You had a run on Twitter a few days ago um, talking about just how nobody had had found any concrete proof that like everyone was accusing everyone else of being this Russian hacker. And um, I guess I'm just interested in this like, like I actually hadn't realized how little, pr- like truly how little proof there was for all of this stuff. I thought there was more than your own research and like a few other things, but it turns out not so. So I'm just wondering how, what you both think about um, basically why has uh, Russia's use of the internet or the Russian trolls become the defining anxiety of this moment? Well, I can just give a little more context about that rant, and that was that um, somebody had written an article. It was right after the Senate Intelligence Committee hearing where Clint Watts, this um, Russia expert and cyber war dude, was like, uh, Russia used kind of Bernie supporters to spread propaganda. And um, it was a kind of, you know, I I, I read his testimony, and, and this was the kind of thing that kind of really annoys me because, you know, it, it's just this general... Thing and and with no kind of specifics behind it, just saying that because they were advancing these kind of like anti-Clinton narratives, or because they were, you know, uh, kind of saying things that that Russian propaganda also said, they were kind of he was implying that they were part of this tool in this massive Russian propaganda campaign. But so so this blogger took that and then said, look, uh, turns out a lot of the pe- the Bernie Bros who were harassing people during the campaign were like. Russian trolls, um, and and that just got me even more annoyed because it it was just making this leap. And I guess one one thing that I've been trying to harp on again and again in this whole discussion is um, my article is often used to kind of uh, back this idea up that there are there's a huge amount of Russian trolls that um, you can never tell if somebody is. Uh, a Russian propagandist is run, being run out of St. Petersburg. You know, if they're critical of the U.S., they might be a Russian troll. Um, if they're critical of Hillary Clinton, they might be a troll. And I, I guess my point was that in in my piece, I 
went, you know, and kind of was able to link all of these very specific accounts to this building in St. Petersburg through, you know, leaked emails, through kind of assembling this network of, of Twitter bots and trolls who were kind of, you know, engaged in these very specific campaigns to spread this hashtag or that video or whatever. Um, but they were all, you know, connected to this one organization. And everything else that has come out about this, you know, usually has the format of saying, okay, um, this thing on the internet happened, um, it's bad, it's weird, it it seems to be, you know, maybe Russians would be interested in in pushing this narrative. And then number two is like, Russian trolls are a thing, like here's this article in the New York Times Magazine that's like, look, here, they're, they're you know, using deception and pretending to be Americans, and then they go to step three and it's like, so it's probably like Russian trolls that did this weird thing. Um, and I guess nobody really takes the, the um, has been able to, and, and I don't know if it's for lack of trying or what, to actually try to connect these specific ev events to some kind of specific operation or, um, you know, building or person or whatever, just like Vasily was able to, I think, in your investigations into Russian bots and in the Russian internet, kind of connected to this one well-known uh, uh, pro Kremlin hacker who had a kind of reputation for doing this stuff, and so so I guess my point is just that if if Russian trolls are out there, if bots are out there working on behalf of you know pro Kremlin people, they should be actually run by somebody. They should be actually have some kind of um, infrastructure and people behind it, and that if if you're just see throwing out these claims that something that I don't like is happening and it's probably Russian trolls. If you're not able to at all point out even you know specific tweets or or accounts that you think are trolls and then say why, um, I just don't think that you should be like throwing away throwing around those accusations. And I think that's what a lot of this talk specifically about um, kind of trolling, which uh, you know I think that's a separate issue than hacking than you know th this other stuff, but specifically the idea of kind of social media being used as kind of a sock puppet army right. um, has not been. So, but like, given that, like, why is it working? Why is it dominating the imagination of everybody? Uh, before, before coming to that, I just want to add a little bit to Adrian's, uh, Adrian's words. First, uh, this uh, infamous agency didn't fade away. I mean, it develops, it grows, it's becoming more and more media, in fact, instead of being a troll farm. Uh, and now it spans over like 30 websites in Russia. Uh, its budget pumped up about four to fourfold, something like nearly uh, 15 million dollars uh, was reported uh, by Russian uh, um, RBC media, uh, dot RU. Uh, the number of people who work there is probably now at about 1,000, but as far as troll functions are, con are concerned, they're definitely on decline. Uh, and, they, and they started to decline since very unsuccessful operation during the Ukrainian crisis in 2014. Because uh, uh, Russian trolls been, got absolutely nuts when uh, MH17 happened. Uh, they were flooding all major foreign media with commands, I mean, aggressive, awful, and uh, disgraceful. But the, the thing is that they, they were doing it in a such typically clumsy Russian uh, way that uh, uh, it became very possible, I mean, very, it became possible very fast to erect kind of a firewall for this type of language. Um, for example, Guardian was closing their commands for like four days, and then they just came came out, and and uh, there was none uh, since then. Um, so uh, uh, that's 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 the first I mean, devel development of this thing. Uh, but coming back to your question about why and uh, it works, this is less about Russia and Russian Russian technology. That's about fake news as a phenomenon which we know for, for quite a while, the disinformation, misinformation issue has been researched pretty uh, seriously 
both on psychological level, uh, on level of network dynamics, and on media level as well. And um, it's interesting how uh, kind of emergence of the subject that uh, all w which which is being discussed by scientific community, academic community, pretty extensively now, uh, uh, became quite easy to explain when 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 you, when, when you kind of take Russians out of the equation or, or, or measure Russians as, as any, everybody else, and then you just understand that it works because network, di network dynamics works this way, because fake news as a bias, as, uh, as part of cognitive bias or, and selective exposure, make us read what is coherent to our own views or what, is, uh, what makes us our selection of our filter bubble more uh, en entrenched, mm. rather than going on the opposite side and trying to, to, to figure out whether that's true or not. And also the problem is that uh, debunking of fa fake news works against debunking. I mean, because you have to repeat fake news, and even if you try to, even if you try to explain why they're bad, that's that w what is wrong there, you still repeat the original, and people who are engaged in, uh, in, 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 the, in the political debate or, or are very much standing on some partisan side uh, are just saying, well, if Snopes, I mean, I just read it recently in one of the discussions, uh, that if Snopes debunks that, that it's definitely true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is, but like, Russia is, there is a Russian intelligence and there is, like, something's really happening with Russia, something is really, uh, I mean, and, and what that is precisely, um, we don't, I mean, I guess if you guys want to talk about that, we can, but I, I guess I'm, I'm more interested in thinking about, and I'm throwing this question um, to you, Vasily, um, just that we, you know, the United States has hysteria about Russia ever, you know, for the last century, and Russia has transformed in very complex ways um, throughout that entire trajectory, um, but now we've got Putin, and, um, I just, w can you talk a little bit about what is unique about Putin's Russia and how this is or is not like this, the recreation of the Cold War, or like a, a new chapter in the Cold War? Uh, well, this is, this is sort of a new chapter, yeah. I mean, I would, I would not agree it's, it's, it's a new Cold War. Uh, it's an unfinished business of the Cold War in a way, mm -hmm. but it's very different because Soviet Union, was an ideological power. That's that's a huge difference between uh, be, between Russia today uh, and, and 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 Soviet Union. Uh, Soviet Union wanted to spread communism all over the world. This this is a foundational idea of the revolutionary Marxism that all the proletarians of all over the world should unite and. Uh, and, and, and create a communist society without capitalism and exploitation of men by, of, by, by men. Uh, and because this is such a, or at least it was such a tremendous idea, uh, the fight between the foundational country of global capitalism, United States, and the Soviet Union was actual. That was a territorial fight, who controls more countries, more nations, more um, public spaces, and uh, uh, who directs them. Uh, it also was economic struggle, it also was military struggle uh, sometimes, but primarily it was ideology against ideology. Putin is, n Putin has no ideology whatsoever. He's a man for whom ideology as such doesn't exist because ideology based on some values. And Putin, after living all these years from, from uh, the peak of Soviet development to modern Russia, I mean, just realized that no values exist at all. I mean, that countries, I mean, when, when he listens to um, traditional US uh, rhetorics about we are land of free, land of opportunity, pursuit of happiness, he thinks blah, 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 blah. And, uh, uh, well, in fact, they invaded, uh, invaded uh, Iraq. 
they shot missiles on Yugoslavia, they did this, they did this. I mean, it, it's definitely called whataboutism. I mean, and, 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 and they actually made, uh, mm, made final adjust, adjustments about equality uh, in 1968, as far as I remember. Uh, uh, and Soviet Union had made women equal, races equal, and so on at the very, at the very seven, 1917. So why Americans tried to teach us values, and um, so 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 against uh, instead of instead of kind of using the Soviet playbook, ideological playbook, we will be better society uh, and will help you build better society and so on. Uh, Russia says that nobody has right to say they are better than others, uh, and. Uh, uh, and, and it also it also mixed with a very interesting mm, narrative that I, I, I published an article about half a year ago about that uh, that that America humiliates other nations by its exist very existence. I mean that America gains victories like in the Cold War in the fir old Cold War, and then it just disgraces disgrace the Soviet Union, and it never came back to us with some suggestions what we may do together. They disrespect us, they think that, uh, and that goes on and goes on and goes on year by year. When you live in this negation, persistent negation, that everything is bad, then, then, then you just one day start believing that. Because it's, it's a little bit self-inflicting, I mean, self-damage. Self uh, so I think that um, today he kind of created a, a machine. Well, I mean, this is not him, actually. I mean, people, people who, are, who think that this Putin would like it. I mean, th th this is not Putin planning these trolls or, or managing these trolls. This is somebody who thinks that Putin will uh, think positively about him doing this for Putin. Similar about hacking. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really, really uh, not convinced that this was a government uh, level operation. It was not that professional. It was not that well designed. And uh, the most important thing, it was, it was targeted on the content of DNC servers, not the control over DNC servers. I mean, nobody said that they, I mean, the people who hacked the emails sought the con to control the servers. I mean, the real military grade hacker would, would not really look into the content. It would look into administrative, I mean, I think a lot of people here understand, it will look into administrative capacity rather than content. I mean, Right, because they kind of like, they, they outed themselves by leaking those, right? When they could have just continued to dig further and further, yeah. I mean, at the moment when <coughs> they hacked into, in, in, into the server, uh, I mean, uh, these were the days when DNC became as sort of a headquarters of Clinton uh, as a, 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 a candidate of the party. And they were communicating with all the state state the golf servers uh, and allowing distribution of the phishing emails and so on and so on if you control administrative level but nobody I mean n neither CloudStrike nor F FBI said they even sought this <laughs> so that doesn't look like military grade up I wanted to pick up on something Vasily said just about this idea that you know this kind of constant atmosphere in Russia of you know, the U.S. is kind of this hypocritical, right, like, corrupt uh, country with all these problems and, you know, injustices and oppression that are that then turns around and tries to lecture, you know, other countries, right? That's kind of the, one of the main narratives of, of this Russian propaganda and how it, how it kind of um, uh, manifests itself in the actual propaganda is that they you know, because it's not this ideological battle, it's kind of this cherry picking of all the kind of like divisions and flaws in the US and trying to hit at that, right? And trying to 
inflame it or highlight it. So, you know, when I was looking at these Russian trolls, they were very big on like police killings of uh, African Americans, you know, because that was showing how unjust it was in the US. They were very big on like Occupy protests um, because it was showing how upset people were. They really, um, anything that had any sense that there was like chaos in the US, they, they went for. Um, and I think, you know, that, I think that, that people, you know, this idea of, of Russian propaganda and Russian media just kind of being very, like, targeted at all the divisions in society and highlighting them and kind of trying to undermine the U.S. and tear it apart, I think really goes along with kind of this anxiety around social media as being this driver of division and of kind of filter bubbles of, you know, making people really susceptible to propaganda in general. Um, and, and I think that, you know, you're seeing this kind of paranoia both of Russia but also of social media and the idea that, like, we are being torn apart by, by this with the help of Russia. Right, so, like, I mean, and that kind of gets at the, the you know, great threat of all of this or what is genuinely concerning about these discussions is, is are, are the implications for democracy in the United States given that we can be agitated this way, given that like, you know, a bot or a troll or like these people at the agency can participate in sowing these divisions. Um, what, what are the implications for US democracy and in in this era of social media and uh, well i will i will move your thought back to the early days of television one of the reasons why senator joseph mccarthy got popular in early 50s was because of television he was so mad but he was so at kind of engaging in his rants against communists that television channels wanted to have them on because he was attracting audience. Uh, today, what we see about highly partisan ma mm, content is that it works uh, as a glue, not as an attractor of the audience, but as a glue for the audiences. I mean, if you are highly partisan, your audience stays with you because it likes to listen what you say and probably go more and more to the certain side if, as a media. Mm -hmm. And internet provides you with a lot of unjustified, unverified uh, um, opinion and, com and, and, and facts. I mean, sort of, un what is it called? Alternative facts. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then you just create, it, you not only create an echo chamber, you, cr uh, you create sort of uh, this, uh, this glue catch for flies. And not only people become attached to that, but other systems that produce content. Because, uh, well, when, when network scientists started to analyze fake news networks, they immediately, immediately found the patterns, I mean, the graphs and the patterns, that uh, thousands and thousands of attempts to create a fake news fail but one gets viral. And it's usually because uh, it became redistributed into uh, kind of highly anticipating networks. Networks that wait for some fact, alternative fact to appear. And then it just blows up and, 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 and this uh, is getting everywhere. The bad thing that is happening now with the um, uh, sort of with, with the progressive part contemplating against Trump is the same thing what that, 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 that emerged in the right segment of the internet and the conservative internet emerges in the progressive. And because it sometimes is uh, uh, kind of not only a protest, not only a, uh, a, 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 a um, kind of a claim, but the, an action feature that could be, I would say, that could be even more dangerous than on the right side. I mean, I don't know whether, yeah, I, I explained myself correctly, I mean, well, 
clear enough, but that's, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, usually the leftist side is more dangerous than the rightist side. Why do you say that? Huh? Why do you say that? Again, because, uh, uh, be because it, uh, it, it's, it's, it addresses y younger people, it addresses inequality. Inequality is a very, very powerful driver of uh, discontent. And it also addresses people who sought uh, seek action. And I'm not so saying it's dangerous in terms that better not do that, but better think twice before doing that. Mm. You mean that, that if, if those impulses were guided by kind of misinformation or, or uh, propaganda or conspiracy it theories, be, it, it would be it worse? It would be even more dangerous, yeah. Um, well, yeah, no, I think, I think uh, when you were talking about going back to television, you know, I think I have, I'll, I'll do you one better and go to go back to radio, because uh, I've been reading a lot about radio um, in like the 30s and the 40s when there was a lot of very similar discussions about misinformation and propaganda and the idea that radio um, was kind of, uh, one of the main concerns was just that it was this mass medium that would kind of, you know, was, was a one-to-many broadcasting and was kind of just giving, like, turning people into kind of passive, you know, authoritarian subjects that were just ripe for a kind of, you know, propagandist or um, somebody kind of speaking to their fears. And there was this kind of big uh, push from a lot of uh, kind of liberal intellectuals and, and journalists um, to kind of fight propaganda. And there was this organized movement of propaganda criticism, and there was it was led by this group called the um, Institute of Propaganda Analysis. Clyde Miller. Yeah, Clyde Miller was a psychiatrist, I think. Uh, it was funded by Edward uh, Filene of the department store, and they had this like um, kind of brain trust, and they put out a bulletin every month, I think, of kind of different examples of propaganda. You know, here's here's actually they were reinventing the bicycle because Lord Ponsonby in Britain did exactly the same thing 10 years before them. Really? Well, well, yeah, I mean, this is just kind of a recurring thing, this kind of idea of propaganda about how do we fight it. And I think I read a really interesting paper about the Institute of Propaganda Analysis. Um, There's basically like, they, they did two different things. One, one thing that they would do is they had these kind of guidelines, these lists of like how to spot propaganda, right? And there were these kind of like pithy things like, oh, does it appeal to your emotions? Does it, you know, um, seem, I don't, I don't remember what they were, but there was, you know, something that you might see on Twitter now, like six ways to make sure you're not sharing fake news. Um, and yeah, The paper called Seven Scenes of Propaganda. Yeah, yeah. And it was this like kind of, um, checklist mentality and a very kind of like trying to inspire this like hyper skepticism and kind of suspicion of any kind of right like non-truth. And then there was this other kind of um, document that, that the, the people analyzed which was kind of a more holistic idea of here's how to kind of train people to be you know um, more self-aware more kind of uh, I guess propaganda immune citizens, and one of the more interesting tips that they 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 had, one of the steps in this was that you had to kind of do this like really intense self reflection of your own, analyze your own biases, your own point of view. Where is it coming from? What kinds of you know sources um, are you trusting? Why uh, it and kind of really stepping outside of yourself and trying to kind of understand you know. What, what is important to you and why, and, and using that kind of self-awareness to then approach these other, you know, maybe more malicious um, intending things. And I guess I, I see a lot of similarities in how the discussion is going about fake news, about misinformation, where on the one hand, you know, you have this kind of hyper-skepticism, like people making lists of you know, fake news sites or, or misleading news sites, which one of them included the new inquiry, right? Because it wasn't this like straight down the middle thing. It was, you know, bias. It was, uh, I think it said yeah, like, it was, like, 
Conspir- what conspiracy thinking and not pseudoscientific. Oh yeah, pseudoscientific conspiracy. It's like yeah, that sounds that sounds right. And and you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, like you say that like it's a bad thing. Uh, <laughs> but but yeah, like back in the day, um, the the propaganda critics got a lot of flack because student like teachers were teaching their kids these tips and tricks and they were like oh uh our kids are now not believing anything they're just like like you know their minds are destroyed by the skepticism yeah nihilist uh and and i think that what you're seeing is kind of in in what you're talking about this kind of like conspiracy thinking on on the left and and kind of these um seeing trolls anywhere that somebody you know deigns to offer their opinion that happens to be outside the mainstream is you're you're seeing this kind of you know like really i think destructive like hyper skepticism when what i think we need more of is a kind of like uh self-reflective you know kind of stepping outside of these two warring or whatever um you know bubbles that we're in and really trying to understand like how how are we seeing the world now and and i think that that is one one way i think you can do that is by being very rigorous about like analyzing the sources and and the um and the kind of flow of information in a way that that isn't so kind of generalizing and just spreading more paranoia i mean this is the last question i'm going to ask before I give it to the audience, but I want to push back on what you both just said. Like, I, I mean, Adrian, to your point, um, m- maybe I'm just basic, um, but I feel like there is something uniquely terrifying about what the internet makes possible in terms of, you know, uh, augmenting voices, in terms of um, people actually getting to like construct the worlds around them that they want. That's like self-reinforcing. Vasily, as you say, like you know, you're just sort of waiting for that story that reinforces what you already believe, and then it it takes off. Um, I mean, the the kind of details of how social media and the internet is is sort of really dystopic and, and terrifying from a media perspective, um, and uniquely so is is something that I want to I want to ask about. You know. You know, through the Trump administration, um, you know, what are we? What can we expect to see? Because I don't think it's going to be what you just said, Adrian. Like, is this going to get worse? Is it going to change? What's going to be happening over the next four years, next ten years? Um, is there anything that we can do to stop it, um, or is there anything we can do to manage it? And then um, to Facili's point, I guess I think um, also maybe why I kind of want to push back against the downplaying of all of this is that. I don't think it's true that the left, that the left getting, um, you know, in their filter bubbles about equality is more dangerous than the right getting in their circular narratives about, you know, what what's turning into white supremacy and fascist uh, thought. I, I would probably co- try to correct me. I'm I'm saying that if this develops simultaneously, it's not the danger that the left bubble develops and the right bubble develops, but they. They both develop, and they don't. They don't discuss the problem between themselves, and uh, uh, and and this 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 creates a potential for uh, unknown social consequences. I mean, which I mean, I mean, I'm not predicting there'll be clashes on the streets, but I said that the consequences of such things are, I mean, are not studied. We don't know the society, mm-hmm. which which this would. We, which we created with the digital discourse. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not studied well. Mm. I don't know if that was a clear. Qu- I, I mean, I don't know. I don't think. It, no, I don't okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just like, uh, I guess, um, just talk about where we're headed and what we can actually do about it over the course of the Trump presidency. I'll wrap it up with that. Maybe the maybe the audience can frame up a better question than that to sort of okay. keep this conversation. Sure. Yeah, I don't really know where we're headed. I think that that <laughs> I I wouldn't um dare to make a prediction about anything, but I do think um uh let's see. I I think that one of the things that was really underlooked and I'm kind of trying to put together an essay about this during 
during the campaign and during the ho whole um, hullabaloo over fake news and of, of misinformation, especially on Facebook, um, where I think it kind of turned into this idea that, um, you know, Facebook and, you know, algorithms are kind of sorting us into these bubbles that are making us susceptible to propaganda, right? That, that if something speaks to our kind of, you know, biases that are being heightened by this, it will, um, this is kind of leading us into this, like, you know, post-truth reality where Trump is president and lying all the time, where liberals didn't see it coming, you know, things like that. And I guess I just, I think that much more interesting to me because I, I think that that just kind of gives, I guess, the the designers and the structure of the platform like so much power almost in a way like like as if you were saying that if you, because of the way that radio was like spoke to you in the privacy of your ho own home or something that that was gonna make you super susceptible to whatever, uh, thing was gonna come out of the mouth of the announcer and you were gonna just turn into this zombie. And I, I really think that one thing that was underplayed during the, during the debate was that, you know, no, this was, this was, I think the fake news debate was very clearly a kind of liberal versus conservative culture, culture war that was kind of playing out over Facebook and specifically over the idea of Facebook, is it going to be a neutral arbiter, you know, like Mark Zuckerberg always says it is, which is what the conservatives kind of wanted. You know, it was very interesting that during the fake news debate, a lot of conservatives kind of took this like internet freedom, you know, being like, this is this is the place that we can get our voice out, right? Almost like they were the um, Navalny and, and the Russian uh, opposition. And you know they they kind of had this meeting with Mark Zuckerberg during um, the summer of last year, where I I don't know if you followed this. You guys probably have followed the the um, kind of news uh, trending topics debate, where you know Gizmodo published a story that that alleged that Facebook was censoring conservative um, topics on Facebook. That became a huge. Uh, uproar in the right wing media forced Facebook to, to fire all of their people. Zuckerberg had a meeting with like all of these conservative powerhouses. Um, and I, I don't know, I just think that I just, I don't know what that means really, but I think that that whole uh, episode and, and the, um, the kind of struggle between like, is it a platform? Is it a media uh, company? And the fact that this has become very politicized now, where where the left wants it to be a media company and the right wants it to be a platform, I think that that's really interesting, and that's going to continue to play out in in really interesting ways. And that I think how Zuckerberg and how Silicon Valley reacts to these political um, pressures from either side is something to watch for. Um, I would also try not to play fu futurism here, because. Uh, I mean, I don't know how it will work out, uh, but I have some. I see some symptoms that uh, probably may give a clue, uh, a cue to uh, to to what is going to happen. First, uh, platform fragmenta fragmentation grows. I mean, people uh, people use more and more and more and more different uh, platforms to communicate. Messengers, uh, for example, messengers were not at all at play in 2012 uh, elections. In 2016 elections, messengers were already used as a platform for distribution. Um, there are new generation of messengers being tested, which is coming, which allows a broadcast platform within the messenger, like Snapchat uh, stories, but imagine that, that, that they are spe specifically designed to be like your tax television uh, in the mobile uh, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. But because it's more fragmented world and world which is more and more packed into your mobile phone, the trends would probably be corrected with localization also. Mm. Because as we live in our mobiles, we, we, we are much more glued to our local events agenda 
happenings and so on, and they will come into our phones more and more because the tools are being developed, the content is being developed, the, uh, the concept of this local communication initiated by device, by artificial intelligence living in your device, for example. This is all coming and it's the, the, the next thing. Uh, as far as Facebook and Twitter and uh, other, other, other social, social distribution is concerned, I think they uh, would have very difficult time trying to figure out how to sort of to, 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 to not be called manipulation fields, manipulation uh, spaces, uh, because all these things that Google and uh, Facebook introduced, this fake news or uh, uh, disputed news buttons and so on, would be very easily used as a tool of political censorship. Mm -hmm. like, um, like in Russia, for example, because we have kind of censorship authority, uh, which, well, doesn't doesn't censor politically, but because Russia has so many restrictions in the press law, I mean, you can't write about suicides, you can't not write about narcotics, you can't write about uh, about uh, terrorism and so on and so on. Uh, so um, they what they what what they do, I mean, the, the partisans, I mean, the pro-Putin or actually not not only pro-Putin. Uh, I mean, you write something on the Facebook which they dislike, and they start to report on you in thousands that you have violated Facebook, fa fa Facebook uh, uh, agreement. And Facebook bans you. And, they bans, uh, and if you, they ban, ban you one time, two time, three time, and that's it. I mean, your audience is destroyed. So, um, so this is, this is a, quite a danger. And, and uh, everyone who thinks about internet freedom should be very, very, very cautious about supporting these efforts as well. Um, I guess I'll open it up to the audience for any questions. Um, how does that work, Nathan? Do they? I'll, I'll take a, a microphone to them. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, just raise your hand and Nathan will bring you a microphone. Well, uh, one of our committee members actually studies Russia and I assume he is, has a, is a burning question. <laughs> yeah. This is Jeremy. Hello. I uh, really appreciate the presentation today. My background's in Russian history. I did imperial history and peasant culture and studies. And one of the things I always noticed and thought was interesting is that every time the czar put a decree out, many peasants would say, he's given us our freedom. Now we're totally free. And they would spread these rumors. And it used to drive the imperial authorities crazy because they couldn't stop it. You know, they basically would say, no, the text says this, but the oral culture of the peasants said, no, they said freedom. Okay. And they constantly mention the documents, the willfulness of peasants and the rumors. I wonder, we hear a lot about fake news in the presentation, but I never heard the word rumor. I wanted to know if you think there's a legacy with Russia because it's, it's so entwined with dealing with issues of rumor with this population, and if that gave them an edge, and if there's any sort of similarities or dissimilarities between what fake news is and what rumors are, or what we think of as rumors. Oh, great question, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, rumors are uh, kind of an oral version of uh, fake news. Uh, there was a great article a couple of years ago, three years ago, uh, about rumors and urban le legends in, in, in Russia, uh, which completely showed the pattern of uh, distribution. Of course, I mean, they were doing that on retrospective material, so, so it wasn't that forensic. As, as now we have with the fake news when we can show the graph of distribution, we can show the, the, the amplifier, we, we can show the source, the amplifier, the secondary amplifier. Um, uh, but it was done based on some declassified material from the fifth department of KGB that was political police. And it was amazing. I mean, I, I'll, I'll share with you this. But that it's exactly the same, but it's an oral version of the fake news. Other questions? Oh, we have someone in the back there. In the green. Give me one second. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed the presentation a lot. Um, I guess uh, hearing Adrian read some of those uh, posts on social media called to mind this. Uh, apart from the, the last Adam Curtis documentary, uh, Hypernormalization, where uh, he's talking about uh, efforts to create chaos within political discourse and this key aspect, which is that 
the attempt to insert chaos is itself evident that you can read the uh, the intention behind it just it's it's not even hidden and I'm wondering if that's intended in these efforts like are we and is it some people are reading it and then people who are maybe less verbally you know have less capacity to detect that it's creating some kind of conflict is it just poorly written <laughs> I mean how did like why, 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 why did it, uh, why was it so badly written? And I guess also, I mean, are we, um, I guess, is, is that a sign that uh, we should, I don't know, uh, that we should, I don't, I don't know if my question is making any sense. I guess, I guess I see two parts. One, you're asking just like, why, like, why are they doing it? I guess uh, the other thing that I was thinking about was like these new Twitter alt accounts. Right. And, like a lot of people are uh, suggesting that there are these verbal tells in them that are uh, making them clearly created by Russians. Oh, so people think language. those like alt, like national parks or whatever are Russian. Yeah. I uh, yeah. I mean, I think um, so. So yeah, I guess the I. I did get very good at identifying the Russian trolls from reading it because you can see it's pretty distinctive. Like, there's a very distinctive, like, bad English, you know, that, that they're putting out there. Um, and, but, you know, I don't think that alone uh, was is a very good sign because there are plenty of, you know, non-English speakers who are not Kremlin trolls who are, you know, have... have weird views on Twitter. Um, and so I think it was, one thing it, that was a sign is, is that, that the research, internet research agency just wasn't very good at doing this. I mean, it was the kind of, it seemed like, um, like Vasily was saying, it, the, the sense that I got was that this was a kind of rich friend of Putin who started this organization thinking that he would, you know, kind of show Putin, you know, what he's made of. He he decided that this would be his kind of, like, contribution to the cause, whatever. They were also, I think, being contracted um, by other parts of the government, right? Like, in, in Russia, one thing I was really surprised by is that um, trolling is, like, something that happens. It's, like, um, you know, from the kind of smallest, like, governor to people in various ministries, they they have to kind of make sure that the internet is like clean. This is our heritage. This is the heritage of the 90s. Yeah. I mean, Russia had gone for a period uh, between the, 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 the moment when Soviet Union ceased to exist and like Putin uh, came through the period of everything is possible. I mean, nothing, well, nothing can true it and everything is possible. It was a period when the, the government that actually didn't control the country, it was like a imitation of government. And uh, the country was teared apart by corporations, gangs, uh, uh, sort of early banks and so on. And they were all fighting each other. And their major field of fight was media. Uh, and all, uh, I mean, uh, well, I was I was addressing Harvard conference on fake news, and I mean, after listening to several presentations, I said, "Feel my pain, or feel our Russian pain," because this is what we've been living <laughs> for 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 two decades. And is the first thing the um, when when two businessmen go into conflict, they start to publish uh, bad rumors about each other or black PR, or, or is called, black right? PR, or, or compromising material. Uh, or hiring journalists to go after uh, someone's lovers, someone's uh, business partners to find out whether this person was sort of bad, disgraceful, mm -hmm. and so on. And um, uh, so, so, so again, it's it's the heritage. I mean, Russia uh, Russia has uh, been known for that for quite a while. And actually, there are some people like. Paul Monafort, who have been participating in that <laughs> since mid-90s. Right, he like exported PR exported to... Exported this yeah. technology. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's one thing that's really interesting is that the troll farm, and this this is really an outgrowth of the black PR industry in Russia, and the idea that every kind of politician, every uh, operator will have their own kind of troll farm getting out the word, controlling their aspect, you know, and so this guy is basically a subcontractor for all sorts of various ministries, politicians and things, and, and they just happen to 
have one contract or have one effort that was aimed at the US? Can you put the question back here? Where are you pointing? Oh, sorry, uh, there's, there's a woman uh, with a button that's shining. With the button, huh? <laughs> the button that's <laughs> shining, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the term that you've been using a lot, troll, um, and that term itself seems to be a bit of a fixation in the media right now, um, and why the, uh, the actors that you've been talking about uh, should be defined as trolls, and why you think there is this fixation on kind of the mythical figure of the troll right now. Um, well. I, I called them trolls because that's what they call them in the Russian internet. And actually, like, it's very interesting. I've, I've reported on the internet all over the world and everywhere. It's like, has the word for, for trolls, you know? It's like this cross-cultural phenomenon. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a very well-defined idea of, like, an internet troll in Russia. I don't, I don't know if it's any different, do you think, than in the U.S.? Like... Like edit, uh, Reddit troll? Yeah. Um, what's what's a troll in Russian internet? You think? Uh, well, I would I would say that first this is uh, well the difference between uh, between like American understanding of trolling, which is somebody who follows you and 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 always say say something bad about you or your opinions or your your your, your operations. Uh, no, Russian Russian trolls don't follow you. They don't like harass you. Uh, really. Yeah, their 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 method is not the personal harassment or not even the brand harassment. Uh, they they did it a little bit uh, with the, with the mainstream media during MH17 phase uh, of of conflict, but that proved to be very wrong, and because they got suppressed. Uh, 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 technologically, they 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 are easily detectable through language, through IPs, through uh, management software, because most of these things are artificial entities. I mean, they've been created by a human, but but they operated by a software, and uh, their their goal is to create a to create a white jam, like to jam certain things or amplify certain things. Uh, you under, I understand you mean you, you're a very young, young person and you don't remember the Cold War. During the Cold War, uh, uh, United States have been broadcasting persistently onto Soviet bloc with Radio Liberty, Radio Free Europe, Voice of America, and Soviet Union was jamming these broadcasts. There were special radio stations uh, uh, around Russian borders, Soviet borders, that been uh, sending jamming on, on the same frequencies. Uh, what this troll farm, this, this agency does, it jams messages. Uh, sometimes amplifies messages they want to hear, but normally they jam messages. And then they trade it, try to export it to United States and, and so on. They, they had some successful operations, but uh, again, I mean, this is very difficult to maintain it and uh, to, to, to create, to get into some very specific areas of fear and so on that you can exploit. Uh, I mean, w before we, 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 we came here, I, I, I just reminded the story about Soviet active measures uh, in, in, in 80s, in 60s, 70s and 80s, when Soviet intelligence was really faking the news stories to make them distributed in the foreign media. And the most famous one is about AIDS being invented at Fort Derrick by American biological weapon um, specialists in order to kill black people separately. Uh, and that got picked up, especially in the third world, especially in Africa, because it was so racially determinant and Soviets were pushing it really hard because they needed kind of a revenge for some of, like for, for example, for failing Afghanistan operation. And in 1987, uh, actually it was George W. George, uh, George Bush's father uh, who met Gorbachev when he was, I think he was president-elect at this moment. 
And he told Gorbachev that if Russia would, Soviet Union would not stop this campaign, United States stopped supplying insulin. And at this moment, Soviet Union was 100% dependent on American insulin. And the next day, all the stories disappeared. So that's real trolling. <laughs> that's the real one. Uh, but but in, a, in a present form, this, this what we call Russian trolls are semi-independent. I mean, Putin cannot tell them, stop being anti-American. Now support Trump. They would not, they're not that controlled. Yeah, I think I think you bring up a good point about trolls in Russia. You know, I think it's much more tied to this idea of like um, kind of astroturfing or the idea that if if you say something, a bunch of trolls will appear in the comments saying, you know, you're wrong, you're um, you know, spreading conspiracy theories or whatever. Um, and it's much more about like kind of suppressing or manipulating information on the internet versus I think in the US it's about kind of um, harassing, about kind of being outrageous, about um, you know jamming the conversation, but also it's more of a like performance or something. It's bringing emotions. Right. It's bringing negative emotions. F Russian trolls really don't care about emotions. Right, they it's much more utilitarian. Yeah, they're they're just trying to and I think it's interesting, actually, like, I, I would say that now the Russian definition is kind of seeping into the U.S. And I think when people are talking about trolls now, it's much more this idea of, you know, the, the kind of, like, um, uh, sock puppet account, yeah. the kind of inauthentic, like, kind of um, actor. D dishonest actors rather than... Rather than somebody being a harasser, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know what that means, but so it's this interesting. There's a great story about um, some company that maintains fringe left and fringe right, uh, 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 like a kind of blogs mm -hmm. at the same time, and they actually republish... I mean, I mean, just forgot it was yesterday or day before yesterday was published, uh, uh, <laughs> that, that they, they, they use the same content, but they change like few words in it and it becomes fringe left fringe right <laughs> um i mean i, I just want to build on the conversation um by you know we were um Vasily in your own writing and you've referenced it you, you described this like typically sloppy russian style of doing things um uh, and you don't think that the russian government like the way that we're thinking about it is like oh putin is like has this master plan and you know all of these are these are all deployed um, at his design, and yet, however it's coming into being, this, these trolls and the kind of disinformation or the blockages of information, um, he's, it, he likes it, it's good for Putin. So Putin is, uh, is not distancing himself from it. Um, I guess my question Putin is, what does Putin Putin want? doesn't use internet. But does it, does it? At all. What, I mean, I, I just, I just I, I honestly speak. Yeah, but what does Russia have to gain from this? Like, from what we're describing here, like this sort of confusion internet. Does Russian want anything, or is it just, is it just happening and it happens to be from Russia? Well, I think here, in, 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 terms, of, in, ter in terms of political goals that uh, Russia and Putin may pursue with this, this is the real trolling in American style. I mean, uh, bringing emotions into certain type of discourse, making people harassed, making people kind of humiliated in response to something that happened 25 years ago. Mm. Like, uh, I mean, first thing that uh, you, you'll figure, figure out if you go into Russian media space, even Russian English media space, that on, on, on every argument that um, American press or American politicians make, made against Russia uh, today, they say, and you bombed Belgrade. <laughs> it, was, it was quite a while ago. It was <laughs> three presidents ago. <laughs> you, you started war in Iran, in Iraq. It was four presidents ago. Mm. And it's a completely different set of people now. But, but, but now we want you to answer for that. I mean, Europe already forgot about that. Mm. And, and Russians maintain this because that's, that's for them a feeling that when they bring these wrongdoings or I mean, some, uh, some not really nice 
episodes in American history that Americans are harassed with that. Well, I guess you were you were kind of saying also though, like I'm curious about your thoughts. You know, like what are they? What is the actual goal of like, for example, Russia Today? Right? You know, people who work for Russia Today. What are they trying to achieve? And, and you know, because I think that 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 is something that is often um, put in into the context of trolling, right? Of of that it's that kind of above ground. Well, uh, well, first, I mean, people who currently operate Rush Today, and actually who operated Rush to, R- RT and Rush Today for all these years, was to get a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the total budget for those, I mean, Rush Today was created in 2005, uh, so for, for this uh, nearly 12 years, they soaked about $3 billion from Russian budget. I mean, it's a very lush life. <laughs> uh, uh, technically, what they achieved, they, they created a, a channel. They, they have some distribution. This is not really something popular. And as a broadcast operation, it's really weak. I mean, you cannot find any, any, any serious ratings uh, in any country where RT works. Um, if you look at the Sputnik and, 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 and other side projects that, that they created, it's a minuscule, it's a really minuscule media. Like RT altogether, RT.com, has about 100 something million viewers monthly uh, as a website. Only 15% of them come from America. So it's about probably 25 million American uh, visit, visits to RT. During not even users. Not visits. even users, yeah. visits. I mean, it's not, it's not users. And it's probably, you have to divide it by six, usually. So, uh, and then you compare it to Drudge Report, which has about three billion. <laughs> right. And then just, let's speak about Russian propaganda. <laughs> or Breitbart, which has a billion. Right. And, uh, yes, and RT... They, they R- want something yeah, very RT, concrete, right? Uh, there is no doubt that RT somehow participates in, in these networks. They verify, amplify uh, certain stories. Sometimes they are a source of the story that, start, that, that is being picked up by alt-right or, or whatever. I mean, even, even le- legacy media sometimes pick up Russian story that is completely un- uncarabated and, uh, and abs- unsub- substantiated and then start to amplify it. But the biggest problem is that, um, that in my opinion, I mean, this overestimation of RT and uh, Sputnik influence is that, well, for the first time s- since uh, the moment when Brits got United States into Second World War, somebody maintains persistent media operation on your, on your soil. This is very unusual for America. When the other, when yep. the, uh, this is well right. known. Yeah, the Brits, Brits conducted the long PR operation to bring Americans into war. So that's, that's exactly the same thing. So, so Russia Today might just be a huge graft by the people who are running Russia Today. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's, that's, that's interesting because I, you know, in talking to people about trolling in Russia, I talked to this one guy who runs a, a troll operation, and he was, I was just like, okay, so why is this such a thing? And he's like, well, you know, honestly, it's because all these troll operators are kind of good at like scamming the people above them into thinking that this was actually useful and working when really they're just like, you know, able to show these like very impressive metrics to, to these like clueless, you know, uh, politicians to be like, look, uh, we sent, you know, one million tweets. Uh, we, we, we got you a hundred thousand followers, even though it's just such like so crude and kind of useless, but because this is all kind of being done on behalf of these people who don't know anything about the internet, it seems very impressive. And so, so he was trying to say that this is kind of just a giant scam, uh, and that any actual effects are just like right. kind of, yeah. So, so we're at time, but it sounds like the sort of concluding statement here is that this is all one huge troll <laughs> on all of us, <laughs> and th- uh, we should calm down a little bit about it. Yes. All yeah. right. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we have to use our cl- critical thinking always, always. Right. Okay. Well, thank you both so much yeah. for thank you. Thank you. and theorizing the web.